Yo, what's going on guys? Welcome back to Baloney Basketball. This is episode 11. Uh, you guys already know I'm here with Johnny. Uh, how's it going, Johnny? Not bad, not bad, Gary. I uh, hope everybody had a good holiday, but we're back and ready to talk some basketball. Yeah, and uh, as you guys probably can tell by my bright window back there, uh, we're recording this Friday morning. Uh, so if that's why I was confusing, then yeah. Uh, but we're just going to get right into it. Um, let's start off talking about a team that got off to a really good start, really. Um, the Minnesota Timberwolves. Uh, I believe they were like 10-7 and 7 at one point. They were sitting like around 5th or 6th in the West through almost a fourth of the season. And then they lost 11 straight games. Now, granted, they did win yesterday against the Sacramento Kings. But 11 straight losses, that's pretty insane. Uh and now we hear like Carl Anthony Towns trade rumors to the Knicks. Um, what do you make of the Timberwolves right now? Well, I think it's pretty clear that they were exceeding expectations early on in the season. Um, Wiggins has clearly been playing very, very well, but I think it's just time that I, I believe Covington will be traded at some point. Um, and so I think it's going to be sooner rather than later. Yeah, um, it just seems. I mean, I didn't think that their off season was that successful. That's why I was really surprised by the start they got off to. But it seems like they're sure to make a move or two. Uh, obviously, Jeff Teague's been on the, on the market. Uh, you said Robert Covington. I don't think Carl Anthony Towns gets traded this year. If he were to get traded, it'd probably be like by the end of the season or something. Uh, and I don't even know if it's to the Knicks. Like, what do we think of just like the Knicks rumors? Like, do you think that's possible or do you have it as like no chance going to the Knicks for Carl Anthony Towns? I have it as a very slim chance. Um, anytime the Knicks have rumors, I don't look too much into them because just about anything they say never ends up happening. You know, they were huge players in the off season and they came away with uh, Julius Randle as their top guy. Um, so I never really looked too much into it. Um, and I like how their report is they're going to look for disgruntled superstars. Like, come on now. Yeah, um, I don't know. I can't picture anyone getting the Knicks, like, recently. Um, but I do think eventually he's going to – I don't see him ending his career in Minnesota. Uh, it just seems like the, the theme where they have, like, a talented big man and they get out of town, happened with Kevin Garnett, who wanted to stay with the Timberwolves originally. Then it happened with Kevin Love, and it just seems like it's going to happen with Towns as well. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, and we'll throw in my desire to actually land a spot for Covington as the Warriors. Um, I think that they could put together a package of Covington, a lower salary, and a pick to get d -low. Maybe that'll keep Towns in Minnesota and then... You know, the Warriors are going to be healthy next year, so you get Steph, and then you have Clay and Covington and Dre on the outside. Three great perimeter defenders. You get a three and D guy in Covington. So that's kind of where I want him to land up. I think at this point, too, Covington kind of plays like Iggy, but he's probably a better shooter. He is pretty inconsistent at times, but uh, when he's on, like, he's a really good shooter. But, um, yeah, so moving on, though, to the next topic uh, some troubled teams at the beginning of the year start to get on a roll. Uh, the Indiana Pacers, like they were like, I think 0-3 or 0-4 at one point. People were saying fire Nate McMillan. Uh, you know, the Utah Jazz, they've been winning a lot recently. The Nuggets and Rockets, granted, they did lose on Christmas Day, but they have been playing well before then. And uh, same thing with the Blazers, although they got one bad loss just the other day. But other than those one losses, they've had about – probably six or seven games where they put together like pretty nice roles. Um, do you think all these teams could be dangerous in the playoffs? Do you think that all of them will make the playoffs? What are we thinking about some of these teams? It's actually funny because my one note um, is, you know, it's expected that these teams are at least playing well, but do we really um, expect any of them to be contenders for the championship? And if we're being honest, maybe only the Rockets are championship contenders, and that's assuming that they just go on a super uh, like hot streak because I don't see the Pacers winning it. The Blazers are more likely to be a bottom half playoff team. The Jazz are going to be right in the middle. The Nuggets, you know, they're going to be a top four seed probably, and as are the Rockets. 
but I think the Rockets are the only ones that may have a legit shot at a title, and even so, I think it's very slim. Um, I actually don't think the Rockets have the best chance of winning it out of all these teams. I think it's personally the Jazz. Uh, if the Jazz can get rolling, because uh, they've been pretty bad offensively for most of the year, and they always get off to slow starts in the regular season, and they usually have a tougher schedule at the beginning of the season. So if they start playing well for the second half, like they had the last two or three years, like they could get a top two, top three seed by the end of it. And Donovan Mitchell, he's averaging 25 points a game. They have a reliable second option now in Bogdanovich. Uh, Rudy Gobert, he's going to defend the best big man. Uh, and then obviously like Mike Conley, um, Joe Ingles, you know, he's pretty big for the playoffs. All those guys, Ed Davis is a good rebounder off the bench. I think they match up well. I think they have the potential. If I would say if the Clippers cannot, or if the Clippers, how, how do I want to say this? Okay, so when it comes to like the Clippers-Lakers thing, I think the biggest thing, the biggest team that could give them, either of them a problems at their best potential would probably be the Jazz just because of how great defensively they are. But I also think the Pacers, if they get fully healthy, they could be a threat. Um, as for the Blazers, I'm kind of disappointed with how they played this year. And then Nuggets and Rockets, I mean, they're going to be there no matter what. Yeah, my biggest issue with the Jazz is just look at the playoffs the last couple of years with Harden. You know, they can't even get over the Rockets. So to me, if they couldn't, if they couldn't really get over the Rockets, I don't really expect them to be able to play with the top guns in the West. Yeah, I do. I'll give them like kind of a pass for the first year though, because I mean they were kind of gelling like with Donovan Mitchell. He was a rookie at the time, um, but last year I think part of that was just because their plan for Harden was just like dumb. Like remember they had him like bas they basically just like let him go to the basket, like the way they were like guarding him or whatever. It was just like it was confusing. I've never seen something yeah. like that really. Yeah, no, it was weird. And for a lot of these teams, especially these four teams in the West, you know, there needs to be some luck with the playoff seeding such that you get like a Clippers Lakers second round matchup so that they can avoid them in the second round and then just have to face one of them in the, in the uh, Western Conference Finals. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see how the season plays out. Yeah. Um, and moving on to a team, it's kind of been slowing down a bit recently. Um, although their best player has been having injuries, uh, Toronto Raptors, uh, they had a really crazy 30 point comeback the other day against the Dallas Mavericks. Um, the Mavericks didn't have Luka for that game, but it was still insane. Like I believe the score was 85 to 55 at one point, And I kind of basically just turned the game off and then they came all the way back. Uh, what do you think about this says about the Raptors team? Like, especially when it comes to the playoff time. Uh, I think it really just goes to show the heart that this team has. Um, you know, pulling up this box score again, just some of the names that weren't there. You know, there was no Siakam, there was no Marcus Gasol, no Stanley Johnson. Um, Patrick well, McCall got the... St Stanley Johnson Patrick shouldn't McCall play anyways. Yeah. Patrick McCall got the start. You got 24 minutes from Boucher, 28 from Hollis Jefferson, 22 from undrafted Terrence Davis, 16 from Matt Miller. And if I remember correctly, they closed out with a lineup of Lowry, Boucher, Jefferson, Davis, and uh, Matt Miller. Or, no, it's not Matt Miller. Malcolm Miller. Malcolm Miller, I'm yeah. sorry. Yep. They closed with those four bench guys plus Lowry. Um, it's just this team has so much heart. They're so fun to watch, and, you know, you never see a coach more prepared than Nick Nurse. I believe he threw some zone, actually. Yeah. He threw, like, a, a full-court press type thing and then settled down into a 2-3 after that. You know, it's just crazy stuff that you see in college that he's bringing to the NBA. Yeah, um, I think I said this a few episodes ago, I believe, but uh, when we talked about that one topic where, like, Max Kellerman said the Raptors – would win the title this year if Kawhi was still there. Um, I think it really shows like how like confident this group is now that like they have like championship experience. Um, and like the veterans are doing a pretty good job at like leading the younger guys like the Chris Boucher's and the Terrence Davis's and the OG Ananobis who either didn't have much playing time last year or completely new this year, whatever. 
Um, and I think they're doing a pretty good job with that. Uh, but yeah, this Raptors team, like they're not like, it's nothing new for them coming back. Now they were down like what, 2-0 against the Bucks last year and they came back 1-4 straight. Um, so yeah, I think the fact that they kind of have that mentality where it's like, okay, we're down by a lot. We aren't necessarily out of the game. Like the other teams, they might just coast because they think, okay, 20, 30 point lead is basically over. Like let's put the second or third string in and just call it a day. But they can't necessarily do that against a team like the Raptors. Yeah, and I think that, you know, if you just take a look at the Raptors roster and you look at where these guys were drafted, um, it's not like it's lottery pick on lottery pick. You know, just their bench undrafted free agents in Terrence Davis, you know, Matt Miller, guys that nobody would think of. Siakam was a late round pick. Um, they're a late pick in the first round. And so it's just like, you know, player development is huge within that Raptors organization. And that's, I think, just goes to show what Masai Missouri has been able to do. Yeah. Um, moving on, though, uh, obviously Drew Holiday, he's been in the market recently. Um, and now we are able to trade now that it's past December 15th, like with everyone in the league. But two teams in particular, the Clippers and the Heat, are both rumored to possibly be wanting to trade for Drew Holiday. Um, I know the Lakers were also thrown in there too, but I don't know how possible it would be. Uh, basically, any deal would have to revolve Kuzma. But what do we think about the possibility uh, that the Clippers and Heat get Drew Holiday? Do we even think it's possible for them to put up a deal that the Pelicans might want to? Well, the Heat can for sure throw out a deal that the Pelicans want. It's just a matter of, you know, with these young guys playing well for the Heat, do they break up a couple of those young guys and go after Drew Holiday, or do they just kind of let it ride and pace any building from here? Um, if somebody's going to get Drew Holiday out of these two teams, I think it's the Heat. Um, the Clippers, I don't really see a move that they need or want to make. You know, a lot of times it's like playoff teams like this might want to make a little depth move to have some depth in the regular season, but they can already go like 12 deep. So to me, it's the Clippers who just – stay pat where they are. Um, the only thing that the Clippers may do, which is crazy, is they could go out and get Iggy. I've seen that as a rumor too, but um, for Drew, it cost them quite a bit, and I think they should just stick with where they are. Yeah, the Clippers, they don't want to get rid of like any of their top four, like their, their starting lineup duo or their bench duo. Uh, so outside of that, I don't know how possible it would be to get Drew Holiday besides like maybe trading everyone else. Uh because, I mean, that's how good Drew Holiday is. Uh, obviously, a player like Iggy, though, I mean, he's not really in his prime anymore, but he can still, you know, give you good playoff minutes. So, I mean, that's what that's good for, and that won't cost you that much. Uh, the Heat, I think it would be a good fit. Uh, he's a good defender. Uh, the Heat, they're really, like, intense. They all like to play defense, kind of um, with the main catalyst being Jimmy Butler and stuff like that. Uh, they also have, like, Bam and Abayo, all those guys. Um, and Drew Holiday's going to play hard. Like, he played hard, especially that series against Portland a few years ago. But, uh, yeah, so I think the Heat would be a really good fit for him. The Clippers would also be a good fit. It's just I don't think it's really possible. Or I don't think it was. it's really likely, yet, at least. Yeah, I think if they do, if the Heat go after Holiday, I'm assuming the package is going to have to be built either on Tyler Hero or Justice Winslow. Um, that's just the beginning. Probably got like Derek Jones Jr. thrown in there as well. And then it's just like, do the Heat really want to break it up? Yeah, they also could throw in Goran Dragic, maybe. Uh, I, know, I believe he's on a expiring deal, I'm pretty sure. But uh, yeah, so I mean, that's all options there. Uh, but yeah, so moving on. Obviously, we just passed Christmas, and on Christmas Day is when they put on, like, all the craziest games. Um, let's talk about some of the Christmas Day games. Uh, let's start off in order. Uh, Celtics-Raptors, do we have anything that we want to say about that game? Uh, not much, to be honest. Like, I kind of expected this to be not uh, anything huge. You know, Toronto was you know, riddled with injuries again. So it was just 
I mean, the way Toronto has been playing, though, they've been competitive in all these games, so I expected a little bit more out of them, but Jalen Brown really showed up. Yeah, I thought Jalen Brown played really well. Kemba Walker, solid game, as expected. Uh, it was good to see Gordon Hayward get back again. I feel like he's had, like, so many, like, knick-knack injuries this season. Uh, but, I mean, it's good. Hopefully he stays on the court for a while. Uh, Raptors, you can't really say too much about them losing because, obviously, they don't have a lot of their players. Um, but, yeah, let's move on to the Bucks sixers because this is a pretty – insane game uh the Sixers basically had control for almost the whole game and Giannis I believe didn't even get 20 points uh what did we think of the Bucks Sixers game do we think the Sixers are the biggest threat to the Bucks uh or do we expect them to be the biggest threat to the Bucks because they have the talent I believe but are we expecting them to actually do it in the playoffs yeah, so I was going to say, uh, on paper, for sure, the biggest threat. But, you know, after seeing them play in the playoffs, and now they have no Jimmy Butler, so without their closer, it's going to be tough. But I was just disappointed in this game on Christmas. I expected more. Yeah, um, I thought the Sixers, they really kind of shot the ball pretty nice. Uh, I don't know if they're going to shoot that well every game they play the Bucks, But uh, it was a pretty, it was a statement game for sure. Now, this game was probably the biggest surprise. Uh, the Rockets-Warriors. Uh, what, do, what do we think of that game? Uh, Rockets can't beat the Warriors in the regular season, in the playoffs. With Steph, with Clay, with KD, without any of them, without all of them, uh, nothing new, I guess. Yeah, it just... I don't... Like, do we think, like... I mean, obviously the Rockets, they have a year to kind of gel this year, and then also they'll have next year. Let's let's make a prediction right now. Do we ever see this Rockets team beating the Warriors when they have Curry back, when they have Klay Thompson back, when they get whoever they're probably going to get for D'Angelo Russell or if they keep him? What do we think? Not with Russell Westbrook. Uh, they should have never tricked the dress of Westbrook away. I mean, look at how well Chris Paul's playing. So I think with Russ, they'll never get over the hump. Yeah, and I, I've been saying that too. It's not that I don't think Russell Westbrook is not as good as Chris Paul, because I think obviously he's better than him at this point. But it's just a matter of fit. And Chris Paul, although he was kind of unhappy with James Harden, I think he fit Mike D'Antoni's system better than Russell Westbrook does. So that's kind of unfortunate. But... Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, just look. I mean, look at how well the Warriors are put together. Yeah, Steph and Clay are great players. Draymond's not like an amazing player. He just fits that system so well. Yeah, uh, but probably the game of the night was the Clippers and Lakers. Lakers were up 15 in the third quarter. Uh, the Clippers bench was not playing up to standards. The Lakers bench was playing insane. Uh, and Paul George kind of had a rough shooting night, but the Clippers still found a way to win. Uh, what do we think about this game? I mean, the Lakers outplayed the Clippers the whole game, and the Clippers still won. I think that says a lot about this Clippers team. Um, yeah, when Brown took 12 threes, I don't know if part of that was due to the groin injury or if he was just settling. But one way or another, I mean, he can't be taking 12 threes again. He's got to get to the basket. Uh, Clippers have owned the Lakers in both games, and... Uh, I just think they're the better team. Yeah, I also think that the Clippers are the better team. Um, do we think now we've seen, I mean, two games is hardly anything, but Kawhi and LeBron head to head since the 2014 title are like Kawhi's six to one in favor of LeBron. Uh, both games this year, LeBron has shot like under 40% from the field. Uh, he's, I believe, like three of 17 or something from three pointers. Uh, basically making him shoot like completely inefficient. Are we, who do we think is better at this point? Do we think Kawhi is better or LeBron? That's tough. I mean, every time Kawhi beats LeBron, you know, we bring back up the same argument. Um, what I do know is that Kawhi will, when he does play in the regular season, when he's not resting for low management, he'll give you, uh, as much energy as he can on both sides of the ball. He'll play, you know, 100%, whereas LeBron will sometimes rest during the regular season, even while he is playing. Um, but, I mean, in the playoffs, I mean, Kawhi's just 
been a dog and he's just taking care of business. And I think he's close, if not already there, to taking that crown. Yeah, I don't... Well, I'll say this. I don't think LeBron has the throne right now. I don't think he has, like, the crown or whatever. Um, I think you could argue that either Kawhi has it or it's up in the air. Because I don't know if there's, like, anything to show that LeBron necessarily has it. Now, I mean, obviously, they're the best record in the West right now. And he's either the, like, best player in the team. I mean, Anthony Davis is playing well, too. But... He's a big part of that, uh, LeBron is, but I don't know. I think, at least my opinion, I think Kawhi is personally better. I'm not saying that that's, like, going to hold true forever or, like, the rest of the season, whatever, because playoffs can definitely change that, but that's my thoughts right now. And then um, let's just kind of get to this last game. Not much really to talk about. Uh, Pelicans, Nuggets, it was a bit of a surprise. The Pelicans did win. But obviously no Zion. Uh, what did we think of that game? I think it just shows the importance of Derek Favors on this Pelicans team. And in all honesty, the Pelicans just have way too much talent to be as bad as they have been. So I think they'll turn it around. And, you know, I think they're about five games out of that eighth seed at the moment. So I think they're going to make a push to that eighth seed. Yeah. Um, I think the Pelicans, definitely a team that – you can't fall quite too in love with the idea of like judging a team too early because I mean, they were controlling that opening night game against the Raptors, you know, went into overtime, played them really close. And people thought like, Oh, like they might just sneak in the playoffs because of like how they're playing, you know, like they have a pretty solid team and they don't even have Zion yet. But I mean, they've had a pretty bad start to the season since then. Uh, the Nuggets, I think this just goes to show that they're inconsistent at points. Um, they really need to figure that out before April um, because they can't be like shooting like 90 or getting like just 90 points or so, 100 points for basically a majority of the game. They got a lot of their points kind of at the end. But I will say that when the Pelicans or whoever, whatever team it is, because I know there's like trade rumors, Whatever team has Lonzo Ball on it, and if they're playing the Nuggets, I said this on Twitter, if Lonzo Ball is playing the Nuggets and he's guarding Jamal Murray in a playoff series, like maybe in a few years or whatever, the Nuggets don't want to see that team because Jamal Murray is going to be shooting inefficiently. He's almost always shot inefficiently, and Lonzo Ball has almost always gotten the upper hand on him. And it really would come down to like Jokic having to go out there and have like a, a sensational game. Paul Millsat will have to play really well. Gary Harris, all those guys. And, I mean, the only one that has done it on a consistent basis to some degree in the playoffs was uh, Jokic. But even the regular season, none of those guys have been able to do it for a long stretch. Yeah, and we haven't even seen this Nuggets team really have a ton of success in the playoffs. You know, their, their vet on the team is Paul Millsap. And he had... That run with the Hawks, you know, when the Hawks had those four All-Stars, but they never got over the hump either. So, you know, there's not really like a battle-tested vet on this team. Yeah. Um, moving on, though, uh, we had our first trade. Uh, not really much of a trade, but a trade regardless. Uh, so the Cavs are trading Jordan Clarkson to the Utah Jazz, and the Utah Jazz are giving back Dante Exum and a few picks. Um, we'll talk about who we think, um, uh, kind of won the trade or like what we thought both sides did on the trade, but I think it's crazy. Like the Cavs and the Jazz, I saw this thing. They've made like three trades within the last year, which is, and they've all been back pieces. yeah. Um, but w what do you think about each side of the trade? Um, you know, I know that the Jazz have needed some bench scoring. Their benching has been just getting absolutely destroyed every time it's coming. But I think it was a bit much to give up, right? The Cavs, they got nothing to lose. We'll take a flyer on a high pick and Dante have some maybe we could turn into something good. We got two second rounders out of it. So I think the Cavs really got more than they could have um, for anybody else. So it was really a no-brainer. You know, they, we all knew they were going to deal Clarkson. It was just a matter of what they were going to get and when they were going to do it. Yeah, I thought the Cavs got 
quite a bit on this. Like when I saw the picks were included, I was like, wow, that's kind of surprising. But um, I think a, just a player swap would have probably been good. Um, the Cavs, I mean, having Dante Exum is all right. And I mean, Dante Exum, he provided good defense for them uh, against the Rockets. Like going back to what you said, I don't believe he was completely healthy last year when they played the Rockets. So that was kind of a big um, minus in itself. But um, <clears throat> I think having Clarkson off the bench, they definitely need a bench scorer. I think they thought like Joe Ingles could probably give you, because he's been averaging about 11, 12 points per game the last few years. He could probably be like the main guy off the bench, not an insane scorer or anything, but he could at least lead that unit. And it really hasn't worked out too well. I know he's been playing a little better since he's been starting, but um, yeah. And then also the Jazz, they went around and waved Jeff Green after this too. Uh, so the Jazz are making some kind of questionable moves, but we'll, I guess we'll just have to see how it all turns out. I mean, their bench has been so bad that some moves were needed, and I'm not sure if these are the right moves, but they had to at least do something to try to fix it. Yeah, and their bench has been bad for a while. I think this is probably their best bench they've had in the last, like, three or four years, too which doesn't really say a lot about how good their bench has been recently. And, I mean, it looked good. Like, in the offseason, it was, like, cool. Jeff Green, good athletic pickup. Ed Davis played really well for the um, Nets last year. Emmanuel Moody is not terrible, but it's, like, they just come in and they keep getting destroyed by other teams' second units, like the Hornets' second units. You know, everybody's just feeding them up. Yeah, it's just they need to figure it out if they want to do something in the playoffs. Huh. Um, but now, uh, as you guys probably expected, uh, next week will be in 2020. That's a completely new decade. Uh, so we're going to kind of just go over the best moments of the 2010s. Um, do you want to start off and we'll keep going like back and forth or whatever? Yeah, sure. A uh, little preface. Um, uh, I did like... I did 12 moments, and then I have, like, three storyline type things that affected the league. But um, I have my 12 moments first, so I'll just give you the first one. These are in no particular order, by the way. Um, but I'm going to go with the LeBron dunk over Jason Terry. Yeah, that was a pretty insane moment. Um, <laughs> it, he kind of got back at him for 2011. But, yeah, so what I went with, I kind of went more for, like, just the – kind of biggest moments not necessarily uh highlight plays but i went so i'll i'll do it in a random order uh i guess the first one i'll say is the damian lillard series winners i mean how could i not because who's who's been doing it twice to two different teams to basically like send them home like that just doesn't happen yeah that's a that's a big moment um my second one is the block, so LeBron's block of Iggy in, the, in Game 7 in the Finals. Yeah, I'll piggyback on that because I had that as well. Um, so, I mean, just like the 3-1 comeback in general was pretty insane. Uh, Kyrie shot, you could also put in there too. But that whole series, um, that was just like, kind of like a storybook like ending. But yeah, uh, let's go with, for my next one, I'm going to go with when the Bulls, without Derrick Rose, without Joakim Noah, in 2013, ended the Miami Heat's 27-game win streak, which was really insane. I, like, I was happier than you could believe that day. Jeez, I forgot about that one. That was crazy, yeah. Um, I, I had a lot of stuff in here, uh, playoffs, because I just figured a lot of the best moments kind of came from the playoffs, you know, when backs are against the wall, when you're trying to go for a trip. And so my third one piggybacked off the block it was the Kyrie three in that same game. Yeah, uh, I think definitely that was probably one of the best shots. And I guess since you mentioned that, I'll get this one out of the way. Um, the Ray Allen shot in 2013, uh, probably one of the biggest shots, if not, it's definitely up there probably a top three biggest shot in NBA history, um, completely changed a championship. Uh, it was insane. Yeah, that was, that was my fourth, that was my fourth one as well. So if you want to, if 
you want to go with your fourth one now? Okay, um, I'm just kind of bouncing around my list. Uh, I'll go with uh, Kobe Bryant's 60-point finale. Um, I think nobody's ever going to have that crazy of a game. Well, I mean, uh, I guess it's possible, but just the way that it went out, like they were down like what, 12 or so with just a few minutes left and he got 50 and Kobe's like, nah, like I'm winning the game or whatever. And he just completely went off, beat the Jazz who, I mean, they were already eliminated, I think from playoff contention, but still they were one game away from the playoffs. So assuming like they win like one of those easy games in the season and then like they lose this to Kobe, like that's just like, that's literally insane. <laughs> yeah, farewell tours have certainly been a big part of this decade as well. Um, my fifth one was just the whole 2011 final. I think it was 2011, right, when Dallas took down the Heat. Yeah. Um, that whole, the whole underdog story where Dirk led the Dallas team over the big... Yeah, I had that on my list too. Um, I still think that's probably the best championship ever. Just because of like all, also like all the storylines that were with it, but um, let's go with uh, I'm gonna go with Brandon Roy game four against the Dallas Mavericks um in 2011 in the first round. This one wasn't really much, but they were down like over like 20. I think it was 22 points or so, and he led a comeback all by himself. And this is like after like all the like the knee surgeries and stuff. Uh, it was just, this was kind of basically his farewell game. Uh, I don't count like the Timberwolves stuff that he played, like the five games or the other games after this in, in the series, but this, it was good to see Brandon Roy have a game like this after like everything he'd been through. Yeah, and just, I mean, just listening to some of the things that you're saying, it's even like, like when you think about like 15 best moments, you're like, oh yeah, that, that, there's a lot of moments or like that's a lot like you can get most of them it's like no there are so many moments that 15 is just scratching the surface um my sixth one i went with manu's block of james harden in the playoffs for houston i don't know if you remember that i do remember that uh i didn't have that on my list i don't know i don't know what i was doing um but yeah manu he's like probably my third favorite player ever but yeah that was just an insane moment Everything's an insane moment. I'm saying that about everything. But, uh, so I'll go with my guy, D Rose, the youngest MVP ever. Um, just like the whole season, you know, like watching him in the playoffs, like he was just like unbelievable. Like people, some people might think like a few years down the line when they see like Russell Westbrook and like he was extremely athletic, but like, some people that are younger fans don't know that D Rose was doing that first. Like he was the one who kind of like started that at the point guard position. And um, he, that's why he's the youngest MVP ever. I mean, just pretty simple. Yeah, it's bringing back all the feels, feels for sure. Um, I want to go with that LeBron shot versus the Bulls when they were down 2-1 in the playoffs and he hit that uh, three off the inbounds pass. Yeah. And I guess I'll bring up the other moment then, uh, the D Rose moment, uh, where he banked it in, you know, for game three buzzer beater, um, and then like the meme face he made afterwards was just kind of insane. But uh, yeah, that the jump, the jump into Noah's arms. Yeah, I think that series like was probably the most symbolic of like the LeBron Rose rivalry. Because, I mean, even though, like, in 2011, we got to see them, like, both probably, like, at their best, they didn't have, like, the best supporting cast around them, necessarily. Whereas, like, I mean, LeBron did, but, like, Derrick Rose really didn't. But, like, once 2015 came around, he had, like, Jimmy Butler around him, he had Pau Gasol. Uh, it was more of a, like, fair matchup, I'd say. But, yeah. Yeah, um... I don't have a ton of regular season things in here, but how about that Curry three versus the Thunder and OT to win it? Yeah, I was thinking about putting that on my list. That was probably one of the better uh, regular season moments of the decade. Um, I'm going to bring up a regular season moment, and this one is probably a top five, top ten moment of the decade. Uh, it's got to be Lynn Sanity. I mean, Jeremy Lynn completely went off for probably, like, 
what was it like three or so weeks in the season he could not be like stopped he literally looked like the best player in basketball at one point for like a short time he was probably the best player in basketball but it was just insane to watch yeah that was a that was a great story i have that on my list as well um you know just taking the league by storm there's no better place to do it than madison square garden beating the lakers there um that three against the raptors it was just like a crazy time in sports um yeah so i had that on my list as well if you want to go to your next one okay um i'll say this um now this wasn't really like a i'd say favorable moment but this is like a monumental moment of the decade uh i'd say it's the decision from lebron in 2010 because i think it also led to you know spark kevin durant being content with you know leaving the thunder to go to the warriors and stuff like that um now i know i know some lebron fans will say we didn't start the super team thing it was like the celtics before us or whatever but i think the fact that like the i don't know just the fact that like lebron is more of a factor than probably Paul Pierce would be or Ray Allen or any one player on that Celtics team then. Uh, and you also put it with the fact that he joined a playoff team at that time rather than uh, Ray Allen and Garnett were traded to the Celtics when they were not even a playoff team, not even close. So I think that had a big play in kind of like the big three that we've seen in like most teams recently. But, uh, yeah, so uh, what's your next one? Well, I actually had that Paul thing, too, with the whole decision moving to the super teams. But I think the reason it really was just big was that he took that, he took it to a national TV stage, to a national TV stage and really made his decision in front of everybody. It wasn't just one of those, like, behind closed doors type things. And so um, people are thinking if the best player in basketball can do it, then why can't I do it? And that's where we stand today. Yeah. Um, do you have any others? Or... Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Let's see. How about the – not talked about a ton, but how about that Vince Carter being winner over the Spurs in the playoffs? Yeah, that, that was a series – that's probably one of the more underrated series, I'd say, because that was the year the Spurs beat the Heat in the finals. But the Mavericks, they were an eight seed, and they took them to seven games which is pretty insane. <laughs> you know, you don't see an eight seed take a one seed to seven games that often. And just imagine, like, how different everything could have been if they, like, won one more game. Yeah, that was a that was a, that was a crazy series, no doubt. Um, I think it was just um, one of those things where it just gives the eight seed, or eight seeds back then at least had some hope, but now it's, like, the top seeds in the league, um, our super teams with two or three stars, and then a lot of times the eight seed is just hovering around five. So it's like, all right, you know, you're more likely to get swept than you are to even take them to seven. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with a recent moment. Um, let's just go back to this off season. I think this off season was probably the craziest in NBA history. Like, obviously, you had, like, Kawhi go to the Clippers – Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving went to the Nets, like Kemba to the Celtics, uh, Jimmy Butler to the Heat, like Al Horford to the Sixers. All these people were just going everywhere. Like, I don't know if we'll even see something like that anytime soon again. Definitely not this summer because free agency is a little bit uh, lesser than the past one, but it was insane to watch. Yeah, I, I like that call. A lot of players moving around, not just like your ordinary players, but you know, shifting the whole balance of powers in the the whole balance of power in the NBA. There's some parity for once in a while, and that we don't know it's going to be the Warriors that are going to win it. So um, I kind of like where you went with that one. But mine, this is actually another regular season moment. How about just that whole Lob City? Um, time in general. So between those DeAndre and Blake dunks, those posters over Brandon Knight, um, things that kind of just took the internet by storm, things in the regular season that we still talk about to this day. Yeah, they were definitely like insanely, like they were always a highlight play. Like I remember uh, watching when the Heat played the Bulls and LeBron jumped over like John Lucas and that was like an insane dunk. But Nobody, well, people still talk about it today, but at that season, in that season, like a lot of people started to like basically not talk about it the day after because 
I believe Blake Griffin posterized like Pau Gasol. I, it was either Pau or Kendrick Perkins. I can't remember which one, but like it was just, they were always a highlight play and like everyone was always like in awe with everything they did. Yeah, I mean, anytime, like I said, especially now with like Twitter and social media, you know, to this day, we're still getting flashbacks of these dunks. You know, when people see Brandon Knight, they think of two things, either the DeAndre dunk or Kyrie just destroying him in the um, sophomore Rising Stars game. So it's just just things like this. Um, you know they're top moments of the decade, like when people are talking about them 10 years later. Yeah. Um, my next one I have is the series with the Wizards and Hawks a few years ago and Paul Pierce goes over and they ask him, they're like, did you call bank? And he's like, I call game. <laughs> and like, I don't know. I just thought that was like a funny moment. Uh, he was really clutch in his year with the Wizards. Like that might be one of the more underrated seasons recently. Um, I know he didn't have a great regular season, but in the playoffs, he was insane. And a lot of people don't give him credit nowadays because they see him saying crazy stuff as an analyst, but that was just an insane moment for the decade. Yeah, I even like remember vividly watching that, and he just comes straight up. He's like, and then he's like, "I call game. I'm the truth. This and that." And it was like, "All right, all right. Yeah, I know you hit the game winner." But it was just funny. Like it was just funny listening to that. I thought that was um, that was an insane weekend of basketball because I remember the Rose game winner was on a Friday, and then the Paul Pierce one was on a Saturday, and then the Le LeBron one was on a Sunday. So it's like every day that whole weekend there was a game winner. It was like you always had something to look forward to. But, yeah, it, I just thought that was funny. Yeah, that, that obviously doesn't happen too often. So I like that you noted that. Um, I know we said best moments, but I think if we're going to talk about kind of things that define this decade, we have to look at big injuries, right? So we have to look at the Derrick Rose torn ACL. We have to look at Kevin Durant with the Achilles. We have to look at Kawhi sitting out with his knee injury with the um, – Spurs. We have to look at the whole Zaza Pachulia putting his foot under Kawhi's uh, landing landing area. We got to look at Curry and Clay missing time. We got to look at Clay missing last year's a couple of last year's finals games and Kevin Durant trying to come back to the calf injury. So if we're really trying to see things that define this decade, we do have to look back at injuries that help play a part in um, directing the decade in. Um, maybe maybe giving some teams better shots to win the title because the top contenders were without their top players. So I just think that um, while they're obviously not fun to talk about, they're things that we should know. Yeah. Um, and going back to the one series where you mentioned like some of the injuries, uh, I was going to credit the Raptors just for winning the championship this past year. Um, you know, getting over the hump that like they never could because it seems like they were always like, like LeBron was their kryptonite and the first year that he's gone from the East, they took advantage of it. Um, and the only year that they had Kawhi, uh, I know they're still really good right now. Uh, but I don't know if anyone's necessarily picking them to win the championship. Uh, so it was just cool to see. And all those guys besides Kawhi, like they had not, like a lot of them were veterans that had never won like Kyle Lowry, Marcus Gasol, Serge Ibaka. Um, well, I guess Danny Green also had won before then. But outside of those two, there it was like everyone was getting a championship, and it was insane. Yeah, and obviously they had a good team, but I just think um, now this after like what Masai Jerry did, I think it's going to kind of lead some general managers to kind of take that risk, right? So teams that um, make the playoffs every year, teams that maybe win a series, maybe win two series but can't get over the hump, are going to say, okay, maybe we'll mortgage a bit of our future to try to get to try to acquire that star, even if he's a rental like Kawhi, just to see if we could win the title because we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. We're good, we're sometimes great every once in a while, but we're never always good enough to win the title. So let's go out there, let's train for the big star that's not happy, he's not happy with the situation, even though he might be a rental, and just see if we can win a championship. Well, that's kind of like what the Lakers did, too. I mean, Anthony Davis, he's a free agent after this year. If I mean, it's working out right now, but if it were to not, like, work out, like, who knows? He could go to the Bulls. He could go to, like, another team like the Knicks, the Celtics, like, any big market team. Uh, so, like, that was a game I wanted to tell because they traded Brandon Ingram, who's playing insane. They traded Lonzo Ball. Josh Hart's a nice piece. 
and like multiple draft picks too. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I think that situation um, is similar, but just a bit different in that teams like the Lakers are big market teams, so they don't like necessarily always struggle getting big players to come their way. But a team like Toronto, who's not even in the United States, may have some trouble with running stars out their way. Um, but I guess there's enough blabbering about that. Uh, mm-hmm. We'll just get my final moment of the decade and i'm going to go with farewell tours star players final games uh jersey retirement so we're looking at players like kobe tim duncan dirk um Manu retired tony parker retired right so we saw kobe have two numbers retired we, we saw him put up 60 plus versus utah in his final game we saw duncan have his number retired then go to some like taekwondo for a year and now he's coaching we saw Derek now have a street named after him or the stadium. So it's just things like these that have like not only revolutionized the sport, but just really revolutionized the city. Um, and it's just given so much hope to children near the area. And it's just great stories to talk about. Yeah, definitely. And there is a lot of great players that, you know, retired in this decade. And it's unfortunate that we're not going to see that anymore, but it was really fun to watch. But uh, I got three or four more, kind of. Uh, one of them, this one's not much, but just like all the Kawhi memes recently, you know, like the laugh, the fun guy, the board man gets paid, the what it do, baby, all that stuff. Like, I just think that's funny, mainly for social media and stuff. And I think those memes will live on for a long time. Uh, yeah, um, certainly funny. Uh People are just using them all over Twitter, but a guy like Kawhi, he doesn't care. Yeah. Uh, another one I have is uh, Isaiah Thomas's playoff run in 2017. Um, it would have been, uh, it would have been unfortunate if the Bulls like ended up winning that series in the first round because we went to get to seeing what Isaiah Thomas did in the second round, which was even more insane. Um, you know, playing through like the death of his sister and stuff like that like that's just like and then he goes out and drops I believe 53 points on the Wizards like and the dude is 5'9 after all so like that's just like unheard of and yeah I just think that that was an insane moment too um yeah I mean I mean the whole storyline he took Boston's it's like um he took the whole city of Boston by heart. And then it's like, you know, he's talking about how to back up the Brinks truck, this and that. And then it's like, next thing you know, he's traded. Now he's injured. And it's just it's like, oh man, like this is not something we wanted to see. This is not how the story should end. Yeah. I think he's having probably the best uh, time playing since that injury though, this season, which is good to see as well. Um and then this this is kind of like the last one ish. I have one more thing I'm gonna say after this, but uh, I have the Dwayne Wade purple shirt guy thing with the Hornets. Um, that was probably the last time we got to see like Dwayne Wade go like completely flash mode. Um, I mean, we did see it in his like final games too, but on a playoff atmosphere, like it it was just really insane to watch because a lot of Hornets fans thought they had it, and then it's like, oh, here comes D Wade, like. He's just going to keep coming and keep scoring. And then, like, staring down the purple shirt guy. Like, I feel like that's an iconic moment that's kind of underrated, I'd say, in NBA history. Yeah, um, I think it's kind of – I think it was cool of you to tie in the fans at some point in this, um, even though it was a fan heckling. Um, But I think that that was a perfect way to kind of wrap up this segment, for sure. Um, It was was a funny moment as well. You know, fans – I think it's – I think just like one thing of caution we could kind of say is that fans have like all this power and that they could say all these things they want and then we just expect the athletes to be quiet. So it's kind of funny like when like when you see an athlete just show up the fan. Yeah, and I will say like I put down like some of the uh, rivalries from this decade. So I mean I'll list them off I guess real quick. So like obviously you have the Cavs, Celtics. Like I'm gonna go in chronological order. So it's not like confusing, but like the Cavs Celtics, that was a big one. Lakers Suns, the Celtics Magic, Celtics Lakers, Grizzlies Spurs, Grizzlies Thunder, Mavericks Thunder, Bulls Heat, Grizzlies Clippers, you had the Thunder and the Spurs, the the Heat Celtics, the Pacers Heat, 
Spurs Warriors, the Heat and Spurs, Clippers Rockets, Bulls Cavs, Rockets Warriors, Cavs Warriors, Thunder Warriors, and then probably now you have the Clippers and the Lakers. But I just thought like those are probably some of the biggest rivalries from this decade that I kind of wanted to mention because um, like anytime any of those matchups happen, it's like you had to tune in to like watch. Yeah, yeah, I agree for sure. Um, um, not really a whole ton to add to that, but um, it is it is something to note for sure that um, whether it be players or teams, that there were a lot of rivalries that kind of defined this decade. Yeah, for sure. Um, and now moving on, you guys know daily picks is what we do to end the show. Um, last week, uh, Johnny did pretty good. You got four of seven, just over half of them. But me and Edwin kind of me and Edwin uh kind of struggled. We got two of seven. Uh, not the hottest week for us. But uh, so we're gonna go through this week. Uh, Friday, so tonight we got the Sixers playing the Magic. Who's winning that game? Silly. I'm going with the magic. I'm going with the surprise. Uh, Saturday, we got the Pistons Spurs. Who's taking that one home? The Spurs. I'm going with the Pistons. Uh, I guess we're different on both. Uh, Sunday, we got Mavericks Lakers. Who's winning that? Dallas. Yeah, I also got the Mavs. Um, LeBron could be injured. We don't know. Anthony Davis, I think, is still dealing with something. And Luca just came back, so I'm picking the Mavs. Uh, Monday, we got the Heat and Wizards. Who are we taking on that? The Heat. Yep, I got Miami, too. Uh, Tuesday, we got the Sixers Pacers. Who's winning that one? Uh, Pacers. I also have the Pacers winning that. Uh, Wednesday, we got the Trailblazers and the Knicks. Who's winning that? Portland. Yep, I got the Blazers. And then Thursday, to close out the week, we got the Jazz playing the Bulls. Uh, who's winning that one? I got the Jazz. I got the Jazz, too. Uh, maybe if I pick the Jazz, the Bulls will win. <laughs> so uh, that's the way I look at it. But uh, this is a pretty lengthy show, the final show of the year and the decade. Pretty insane. Um, do you have anything to add at the end, Johnny? Uh. Nothing huge, but if you guys kind of just want to comment below if we missed any big moments in the decades or things that you guys thought should be um, on there that we didn't include, feel free. But um, like I said, it was pretty tough to kind of just narrow it down to 15. Yeah, um, and I, I even kind of like went over 15 a little bit. I think I picked like 17 total, but I was like trying to pick all of them. But yeah, I don't know. I'm sure we still missed some out there. Um, if you guys watching... Like, let us know if we missed any. But, uh, yeah, I think that's going to do it for this episode. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed uh, episode 11. And uh, we're out. Peace. Peace.